podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast. I'm John Rojas. Chris can't be here right now because he is in the middle. Well, I don't know if it's the middle or towards the end of the middle of moving. So his studio is still packed away in boxes. So lucky you, I'm filling in this week. And this week we have a fantastic guest. But before I get to that, I have to laugh at ourselves a little bit here. So Chris and I have been doing the podcast for, I don't know, close to 10 years. This is going to be episode 338, I believe, which is insane when you think about it. But that's besides the point. So this is one of the first episodes where we actually messed up the sound quality while recording. And we left it in there because we want you all to hear it and know that we're also human we do our best, but thought it'd be fun just to, to have a little bit of behind the scenes in the podcast. So this week we are talking with Neil Pasricha. Neil's an author, a public speaker, and a podcaster. As an author, he's got an awesome book series, no pun intended, called The Book of Awesome Series. And his newest book is You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life. So you've likely heard of Neil, whether it's reading one of his books, listening to his TED Talk, or listening to his podcast, Three Books. We were super excited to talk to him, and Chris and Neil had a pretty fascinating conversation. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Neil Pasricha. Well, Neil, first, thank you so much for joining me on Smart People Podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. All right, Neil, I got to dive in. I got to jump into the deep end here. And you write about happiness. Uh, one of your books, The Happiness Equation, a bestseller. You've got this new book called You Are Awesome, about to debut as a bestseller. And I got to say, when I hear titles like How to Be Happy and How to Be Awesome, I think rainbows and butterflies and millennials. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, this, there's no, this is all fluff and I know it's not, but that is where I go. I want to start with, do you find it hard to write about a subject that can be so easily misinterpreted or seen as fluffy or even overdone? Uh, yeah, definitely. And the funny thing is I actually backed into it by accident. So I was going through a divorce and I just lost a friend from a suicide so I started a blog called 1000awesomethings.com. And why did I title it 1000awesomethings.com? Well, I thought 1000 was a small enough number that I could achieve 1000 blog posts. And my mother-in-law, who was about to become my, a stranger, essentially, because we were going through the divorce, she called everything awesome. Like She was like, oh, cool, oatmeal, oatmeal muffins? Well, that's awesome. Oh, it's windy outside today. Well, that's awesome. And I was like, it sounded like a bit of a duck kind of thing. I was like, somehow the refrain of that word was like, you know, it was just burnt into my brain. So it was just the first word I thought of. And things, <laughs> I guess, was just vague enough that I could write about whatever I want. So why do I tell you that? Because the, the blog, 1000awesomethings.com, that went viral. That took off. That got 50 million hits and won all kinds of awards, blah, blah, blah. And it therefore turned into my first book, The Book of Awesome, meaning that I was I became pigeonholed on the title. And you run the Smart People Podcast. You probably know, like a lot of people do, it's like when you have a word that you're like known for or that works with you, you got to stick with it. Yeah. Frankly, to be honest with you, I share your thought. When I did that book that you mentioned, The Happiness Equation, I waded into that territory. That that territory is littered with over 100,000 books on happiness already. And I'm not, I didn't make that number up. If you go to Amazon and you type in happiness into the books category, there are more than 100,000 books. If you go on Google, like you, you, it's, yeah, you're right. It's like a gigantic ocean of people all pitching in their two cents about how we could be happy. So I waded into that world. And you know what I found? Uh, that's a hard world to wade into. In fact, 
uh, somebody already owns that word. And those people are people like Gretchen Rubin, who owned, you know, who wrote The Happiness Project. They're people like Daniel Gilbert, who wrote Stumbling on Happiness as a Harvard psychology professor. So I put my two cents into that world too. And don't get me wrong, the book did well, and I'm really happy with it and proud of it, all that. But I do think somehow the universe sort of nudges us into our little corners. And we then have to be aware of, do we want to play with the specialty that we've been assigned or that's working for us? Or do we want to sort of sharp elbow our way out of it? And if so, how do we do that? So I am in this game now too. I constantly get the, the, hey, are you a rainbow and butterfly guy? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. Like, I just am not. I just, you can probably hear it in my voice. Like, I'm not always optimistic. I I have a bit of a hangover right now, and I did not drink last night. Like, I'm just like, we, I didn't drink last night. I, just, I feel like I have a hangover. So I'm just like not that guy, but this is the arena I play in because I'm trying to tell myself how to be awesome, how to be happy. I'm writing to myself. So that's why the material, of course, resonates with me and why I hope it resonates with other people. Neil, I, so I just realized something, and that's that's great. We'll, we'll all splice this in. I just realized because I rushed into – Zencaster. I think uh, my mic is recording through my computer, not my setup. So I'm going to stop the recording and then reopen a new one and then just edit this in. And you know, you mentioned this idea of you're writing for yourself and I totally vibe with that. That's why we created the podcast. I actually didn't tell anyone we were podcasting because the whole idea was how can we trick smart people to give us advice? And it just happened to take off. However, one of the questions I have is when you become this authority in the space, as opposed to just hosting conversations, right? So that's the difference here in my analogy of us podcasting versus you writing. Do you feel you take on a little bit of ownership of now I have to be that expert and how can I be an expert when I haven't fully learned it myself? I'm so glad you asked this because I have wrestled with this for years until I read an essay by David Foster Wallace called The Nature of the Fun. It has been published in a book called Both Flesh or Not. Uh, it's a series of his essays, his nonfiction essays that was published after his death. So I don't know if you know, but David Foster Wallace, author of Infinite Jest and a number of other gigantic, huge, amazing fiction books. He died via suicide, um, I believe in 96 or 2006. So this was published posthumously if i said that word right yeah 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 anyway uh, that was like in my i'm impressed with myself for actually I love yeah, him, off that way. word like i absolutely love david foster wallace oh, okay but, fantastic so yeah. when i talk about him it's like people either love him or they don't know him so i just oh, went yeah. i just aired on the side of like in case people don't know so yeah. anyway what does this essay say listen to the title the nature of the fun he actually and i should send this to you afterwards but basically he says after you have some degree of commercial success which you have had with smart people podcast then guess what the universe as i just said conspires to keep you in your lane <clears throat> you are taught that this is resonating. And as a creator, as an artist, you feel, that's all I wanted. I wanted my stuff to resonate. Yeah, you didn't tell anyone, but weren't you thrilled when people began to sort For of really sure. resonate? Because that's all you wanted. If you make baskets and you sell them at the craft fair and you sell none, that feels worse than when you sell 50. Of course, we want our stuff to get marketable and be resonant because that communicates clout and influence and and, and a connective with your art. People love what you're doing. That's good. But the problem is, so I wrote the book of awesome. Guess what I wrote as a follow-up? The book of even more awesome. Then what? The book of holiday awesome. Then what? Five ca calendars of awesome. I'm not kidding. Five page a day calendars. Then I wrote the journal of awesome. I made the app of awesome. Man, I had 11 properties with the word awesome in the title, right? Mm. And then I was like, it hit me that suddenly everything I was doing when it came to quote unquote my art was for money. I was writing now for money. I was speaking now for money. And it hit me that I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not doing anything just for fun anymore. This essay by David Foster Wallace, which maybe we could put in the show notes, was so impactful for me because it made me realize that I'm like, oh, his argument is that actually the date that got you here was the fact that you had fun with your art in the first place. Hmm. And the nature of the fun is it is really hard to do, but you must constantly, as an artist, kick yourself out of what you're doing commercially and try to find something that just gives you pure joy. You don't want to be the Strokes releasing an album after album that sounds the same. You want to be Radiohead going wildly left and right so that whether people resonate with it or not, you are enjoying the practice of creating it. Anyway, that's a long way of saying, these days in my writing and in my podcast and in my whatever I'm else I'm doing, I am trying to be as selfish as possible. I'm trying to constantly tell myself that if I love it, 
that love will get communicated outwards in a way that either will or won't resonate. But either way, I'm, I'm confirming that I love it. And when it does resonate, it will be resonating for the right reasons. Not because I'm trying to put out like Krusty the Clown, you know, yeah. gruel, imitation gruel, nine out of 10 orphans can't tell the difference. You know, because <laughs> that's like too, I was too far extended down this one little tightrope. So the nature of the fun means get back into being selfish. It's the only way for art to ever prosper. I do agree with the idea of being selfish. I actually, it's one of my points of just something I have to always remember. I talk about it at, at different events and things is the only way you're going to be successful is being selfish. Even people who do charity work are doing it because of the way it makes them feel, which is in and of itself selfish. I yeah. think one of the best pieces of advice that I could ever give that I've learned is that the most successful people find where their selfishness meets their value, you know, yeah. what value they can provide. And I think that's the way to go, whether it be, I don't know, writing or in finance or something where you believe you're providing a service that others need while also thinking it's, you know, accomplishing an internal motivator. Yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen that viral kind of meme online playing off that key word, which I use in my book, The Happiness Equation called Ikigai. So Ikigai is I-K-I-G-A-I, and it roughly translates in Okinawan as the reason you get up in the morning. Well, there's this viral picture of it that goes around online, and it's like um, what, what you love overlapping with what the world needs with overlapping with what you're good at with overlapping with what you can be paid for. And mm. the four things overlapping they call an Ikigai. Now, I don't know if that was made by like, someone in like an ad agency or if it came from like, you know, actual the blue zone of Okinawa where people live longer than anybody else in the world. Right. All I know is it's a viral meme and it speaks exactly to your point. One of the things though, I still continue to struggle with, and I just want to make this whole episode like a, a yin yang, like I want to push and I want you to pull or Great. something. I think Great. it'd be interesting, but is we have this limited attention span and there is so much information being put out there. You run a podcast, so you probably know you get pitched constantly. And it's, it's jading. Like it jades me. I'm just person after person after person. And I'm going, I don't need to hear from you. Like I, I almost yearn for the good old days of the only people that have a microphone are the ones that have truly earned it. And I don't think that is the case anymore. Um, and again, anyone can pick this argument apart. I'm just throwing it out there. No. So, so, what so I'm well, one of the yeah. things and, and speak to all of this, take it anywhere is I, when I dedicate my few precious moments to learn or read or listen, I want to do it from people I feel like have struggled, figured it out, and accomplished, not just from people who are struggling. Yeah, I totally hear you. And, and it's also, I think, important to decide what's your main thing and what's your side thing. And I think it is possible to delineate between those two. So for example, I wrote five books and gave 200 speeches while working at Walmart, meaning that right. my first five books were my side hustle. And in my mind, they were all fun, which is why A Thousand Awesome Things never had any ads on it. It's why I never like monetized my website because I was like, this is just my fun thing. Then when it became a paid for vocation, like the You Are Awesome just came out. I was paid in advance for that book. If it sells a copy, I get $3 for every hardcover. Nice. And I'm in, the reason I'm in Chicago right now when I'm talking to you is because I'm about to go give a speech for a company, right? That was paid for. So what I did to, to create this nature of the fun argument that I'm making with you is I created my podcast. It's not the same as, as most podcasts. For me, it's like it's, it's delineated in my brain as pure fun, meaning – Three books, which is my podcast where I'm on a 15-year quest to uncover the thousand most formative books in the world, is no ads, no sponsors, no promotions, no interruptions. I have no access to the stats page for it. I tell my assistant not to give me the password, and I say right on my website, no pitching allowed. I do not accept. There is no way to send me any advice for any guests. It just... I don't have that vehicle. There is no mm. submission button. There is no form. There is no contact. The only people on my show are people that I personally reach out to, and I reach out to maybe five interesting people a week. And then one of those five says yes. And that, that comprises a hundred percent of my show's guests. Okay. Interesting. But now counter it with you, the creator who is trying to put out good work that gets found. So then guess what happened, Chris? So I tell you about this, how I've made three books, a real pure, selfish, non-monetizable art project. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I told you. Now, 
It's just one Apple's best of 20, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, best of 2018. It's been featured on the cover of iTunes three times. I've been, and all my conversations are live, so I've been hang, hanging out with David Sedaris and Malcolm Gladwell and Mitch Album and Judy Bloom, and I've got a chance to hang out with these people. It's totally life affirming for me just as a, as a person who's a fan of these people. And now corporations are starting to say to me, hey, can we put ads on the show? And I'm like, no, because that's my thing. But then they're like, can we pay you money to just put your podcast on our website? And so mm. that's something I'm starting to explore. It's like, and I'm trying to understand as an artist, is this get away from my values? I think it's okay. So again, what companies are doing is saying, we don't have rich content on our website. And, you know, it might be like a, I can't, you know, I won't say any company specifically, sure. but the company's like, can we use some of your articles and some of your podcasts? And can we use some of your content on our website as a little intranet? And can we pay you money for it? So I'm like, hmm, maybe that's, so what's happening? Because I'm selfish on my art, the art's getting popular. That's right. what I'm trying to show. That's the nature of the actual fun. When you actually are purely selfish. Look, my podcast is crazy. It publishes on the lunar calendar. I know, I, publish, I saw that. I do weird stuff and it costs me a lot of money. Like I'm flying around. I had to fly to Key West to interview Judy Bloom. I had to fly to Detroit to interview Mitch Album. It costs me money and I pay for production because I don't understand anything about technology. So I don't. I can't even press any buttons. I'm like, I just press record and then I hope someone else can fix it. <laughs> and And so this thing is a huge cost for me. But it is part of, and this is something I write about in my new book, it's part of what I call my failure budget. It is money I am purposely spending every year in order to steepen my own learning curve. And I, I love the debate, but I'm, I'm arguing that if you are purely selfish, then actually the universe comes running. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. My absolute favorite part about the holidays is reconnecting with family. I love swapping stories and reliving moments together, but keeping these memories alive can be hard. That's why I'm giving my family the most meaningful gift this year, StoryWorth. When I first came across StoryWorth, I was like, man, this is a really cool and unique gift for my family. StoryWorth is an online service that helps your loved ones tell the story of their lives through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. Every week, StoryWorth emails your family member different story prompts Questions you've probably never thought to ask, like, what have been some of your life's greatest surprises, and what's one of the riskiest things you've ever done? After one year, StoryWorth will compile each answered question and photo you choose to include into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. You never know what family history StoryWorth will uncover. So here's what you need to do. Preserve and pass on memories with StoryWorth, the most meaningful gift for your family. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash smart. You'll get $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash smart for $20 off. And now back to the episode. Why do you think that is? Because we love, because the thing is we live in a village of 8 billion people. So by definition, you're probably going to put out some crap that's the exact same as a billion other people you're going to start an instagram account that's kind of like you're going to start a yoga account that's kind of like the other 1200 yoga accounts you're going to start like a you know paleo blog that's kind of like the other paleo blogs i'm using things that are in my wheelhouse you know blogs and social media but you could also start a plumbing company that just is like kind of has the same hours uh, as every other plumbing company it kind of does the same things we fix pipes and toilets what i'm saying is when you are closer and closer and closer to your purest authentic self guess what there's only one you in the world yes i believe everyone's a special snowflake in some sense but my argument is the closer you are to your core natural resonant frequency the different you are by definition to everybody else because i believe most people at their very core are kind of weird right like they have yeah. weird thoughts they are look at my friend po- uh look at my friend frank warren frank warren runs a blog called postsecret.com man it is a weird project he collects anonymous confessions from strangers and posts 20 of them on his website every sunday and then the next sunday he deletes all of them and starts again he has no archive there is no history by definition this thing should get no hits He has a billion hits. It is the most popular ad-free blog in the entire world of all time. Because he's doing something that's just so crazy weird in him, people are attracted to the most him him he can be. People are attracted to the most you 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 are. And I I definitely am starting to come around to that. I had... Good, I'm trying really hard. 
Well, <laughs> yeah, it is. And I mean, look, it's taken 10 years because I am finally starting to go down this path of I'm going to write a book. I've, I'm working on it right now with a, a publisher and things like that. But it's only because I feel like I have gotten to where I wanted to get to. Like I am truly happy. I am truly everything, my family, my life, my job, my knowledge, my everything. And yes, I have more to go, but like I have grinded and failed and cried and bled to get here. And I think that I can now help others get here. I don't feel like I'm in the mud anymore. And sometimes I'm not saying you at all. This is more a conversation. I just sometimes, and you mentioned this, I heard it in an interview. You said at, at the beginning height of this People are coming to me about happiness. If they ask my friends, my friends would say I'm depressed, you know, and I yeah. get that, that you didn't ask for it necessarily. So I'm not, I'm not saying that what I'm saying is I, I started a blog six years ago and I wrote like four things and it was very helpful. And people said, this is helpful for them, but I felt fraudulent because look, even my advice isn't helping me at the moment. I, I don't know how it can help you. And so that is the struggle that I've been working through and that we're thus talking about. Yeah, I, I totally get that. And I also think that part of what we haven't talked about yet, and maybe this is your four blog post, is <laughs> is, is is the idea of losing more to win more. And so mm. this is an argument I always make and I always remind myself of, is that the reason a wedding photographer has 50 awesome pictures of the wedding better than anyone else there who are also snapping photos is because they are literally taking a thousand photos over a three hour wedding. My, by definition, they are taking 10 X the number of pictures of anyone else. So they have 10 X the number of good ones. Lose more to win more is just a prescription. Look, my whole thing right these days is resilience. So when I talk about resilience, I'm saying just try more things. So the failure budget is one way to do that. Every single thing you try may not work, but just try more of them. So people that are like, oh, I've been thinking about launching a YouTube channel for three years. I'm like, oh my gosh, by now I wish you had launched 12. Because yeah. if you had launched 12 YouTube channels, you would have found one that worked. Well, so okay. part of it's a function of the number of shots you take. Right. So let me let me play again this this counter argument because I'm I'm so You are literally your, the devil's advocate. I am. And you are so <laughs> successful with your books and all the things. I mean, I so I'm genuinely trying to learn this from you, but I'm sure you know this, right? Like this Michael Jordan quote, right? You you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And the Silicon Valley quote of fail fast, it's the same thing yes. as fail your budget and lose more to win more. So why write it? Why not just promote what others have already said? So I didn't know it was the same thing. So mm. two things. One is I wrote authentically to me using my own personal experiences, my own kind of journey. And each chapter in this book is kind of like how I navigated this. Like I launched a blog. I talk about that I'm launching a blog in 1997 when I went to like this nerd camp thing. And then it sucked and no one visited. It got like 100 hits. But I love the high of that. So I, I share a story in You Are Awesome about how I started like 15 other blogs. And I share all of the details of all of the blogs and how they all failed. So the, I came to the conclusion that I just have to try more often. And then I pulled the things that resonated with me. I wrote a chapter essentially to myself about the number of shots. I used examples that I'd never heard before, but that were in my brain, like for example, I got a baseball statistics book when I was a child and I still remember to this day the sort of shock in my brain when I discovered that the guy with the most wins in baseball, who is Cy Young, also is number one in the most losses. Get out of here. Yeah, Cy Young has the most losses of any pitcher in baseball. Wow. Also, let me give you another one. Nolan Ryan has the most strikeouts in baseball. And Tell me he has the most home runs. Well, I'll tell you who has the most walks, Nolan Ryan. <laughs> or walks, yeah. Right? Like he's yeah. That's the worst thing you can kind of do as a pitcher is walk a guy, and the right. best thing is a, is a striker. He is the both. So these days when you hear like Tom Brady has the most uh, Super Bowl wins of any modern era active quarterback, what I like to say is he also has the most losses. When they say Drew Brees, had, like he's been to three or four Super Bowls and lost to the Super Bowl. No one else has been to three Super Bowls and lost them either. You know, when they say, oh, Drew Brees is the most complete passes, I'm going to guess he's got the most incomplete ones. So this is how I navigate it authentically in my brain into that chapter. And then when you say, oh, someone else already wrote that. Well, in my brain, I didn't really know that. And I just share it in, in the way that's new or fresh to me. Guess what? 
there's only seven good ideas in the whole world. Right, right. right? Like everything, you know, you could take Ryan Holiday's writing and say, oh, uh, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius figured all that stuff out two, th- two years ago. You totally. could take Tim Ferriss's writing and say, man, the guy, wrote, the guy wrote, who wrote the E-Myth, Michael Gerber, figured that out 20 years ago. You could take, um, you know, Mark Manson's book and you could distill, you know, The Subtle Art Not Giving. Uh, I don't know if you swear or not. An F, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could distill that and be like, oh my gosh, this all comes from this guy. Like, it is possible to not cynically, but sort of like, you know, with a sort of squinty eye, sort of judge this stuff as derivative of other things. But the whole world is that. Like every word you're using in the sentence is a word someone else said. Every haircut you've ever had is a haircut someone else had before. Every shirt you've ever had is literally sold to a hundred other thousand people wearing the same shirt. Don't think you're special. Oh, I'm, re- I'm reversing now on the special snowflake thing. Yeah. Don't think you're special. Just do what's most authentic to you. Oh, I'm back into the special now. And then that will resonate because it's the most authentic to you. It's you selfish. It's back to our point about being selfish. Yeah. So I guess at the core of it all is we're all trying to enjoy our time on this earth. We do the things we need to do to learn. And we just happen to be in an environment now where those things tend to be published for the entire world to see. I mean, if you want them to be. And also, I think that the argument that everything's published for the entire world actually relieves stress because the haystack that we're sticking all of our needles in is just becoming infinitely larger by the minute. So no one's going to care if your thing sucks. Look, you just said I'm super successful. I could tell you in two seconds a ton of projects that I failed at, even as recently as within the last few years that I've put a lot of work into like books that didn't sell or the out of print. You can say, oh, this guy, Neil, he has seven, he's written seven books. Well, <clears throat> the part of that, that doesn't tell you is the book of Holiday Awesome, my third book, is out of print. It didn't sell enough copies, right? right? You can say, oh, he's a New York Times bestseller. Well, some of my books are, some of them aren't. You can say, oh, he's, um, he's, he's, he's actually done one of the most famous TED Talks of all time. The three is of awesome. That's true, Chris. But actually, did you know I've also done one of the least successful TED Talks of all time? Mm. I, I did. Two years ago, I gave a, a TED Listen, which is a TED Talk that I composed entirely of questions. I composed music for it with a composer. I did a 20-minute weird lighting thing. I practiced in the park with my wife for like six months, and the thing bombed. Do you know what I'm mm. saying? It, it did good yeah. live, but it went on YouTube, and like it just, you know, all the comments are like, ooh, this makes me feel weird, and like downvote, downvote, downvote. So right. I have so many of those losses, and to paraphrase Seth Godin, I'm prouder of those losses because I know that they are a function and a variable leading to me to more wins. So if I didn't have 10 losses, I would have zero wins because every 10 I get one good one. I just keep going for trying 10 new things at a time. Hence, back to the reason why I think failure budgets are important to have. This is fun because it's just me thinking and letting you who, you know, Harvard educated bestseller, all this stuff, you know, leader at Walmart, all these great things like just kind of respond. So what about this? Why don't we all just get together and say, look, the world doesn't need any more information. It's all been put out there by people who have thought on it for an entire lifetime. Let's synthesize it, modernize it every four or five years, and then let people stop searching for new things, realizing there isn't anything new and instead get on with just implementing the things to make their life better for themselves and not for everyone else. The key word you just said in that somewhat cynical sentence. Yes, I am being cynical to, here. To use a little, I, I always allow alliteration. So I love yeah. that somewhat. So, look, I, the, the key word you just said is the word synthesize. Guess what? Everything is a synthesis of something else. I just use some examples of, of friends and other authors and so on. They are synthesizing. You've all know a Harari, the guy that wrote Sapiens. And he oh, wrote, he's amazing. Right. And he wrote this recent book called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Yeah. Um, he has this great argument in there that said in the old days, information was power, right? The king was the one that had all the information or, or the person at the head of the company or whatever. Now, because there's such a deluge, if I said that word right, there's such mm-hmm. a flood of information uh, and it's growing at an accelerated pace. Actually, what's power these days is clarity. Clarity is power. I give a lot of speeches, and I think that really the value I'm offering is I get to go on stage and tell 800 people one specific thing, which means an entire organization gets to face the same direction, believing the same messages, hearing the same research. That's infinitely powerful because otherwise everyone's at their desk watching different TED Talks and listening to different podcasts and hearing different leaders. So then they're all scrambling in different directions. All I essentially really offer as a speaker is clarity, alignment, everyone going one way. And you said that word synthesis. I thought that was a powerful word because is not my new book. You are awesome. 
a synthesis of everything I have researched and believed and learned about resilience. It is. Right. It's not my book, The Happiness Equation, just a synthesis of everything I've learned and researched about happiness. It is. Is not your podcast just a synthesis of smart people like that talking about all yeah. we're all doing is synthesizing stuff so yeah. synthesis actually is not a word to be tossed away it's a word to stop and focus on and say yes actually go ahead and try to synthesize the all the work that's been done that in and of itself will be a new piece of art and now a quick word from this week's sponsor you know what that sound means the holidays are quickly approaching giving holiday gifts is great Overspending on all those gifts is definitely not. So why spend more than you have to? Finding the lowest price is easy if you have Honey. Honey is a free browser extension that automatically finds the best promo codes whenever you shop online. This means you'll always get the best deals without even trying in over 20,000 sites such as Amazon, eBay, J.Crew, Sephora, Expedia, Target, Best Buy, and more. So I have to admit, I was doing a little holiday shopping for myself because I needed some pants. So I went over to J. Crew Factory, picked out three pairs of chinos, added them to the cart. They were already on sale, but I still clicked the Honey Browser extension. It went through all the available promo codes, and it found me an additional savings of $34.47. How awesome is that? I guess I'm just going to have to take that savings and buy something for my wife. Don't tell her, though. It's a secret. Honey has found its over 10 million members over a billion dollars in savings. Honey supports over 20,000 stores online and has over 100,000 five-star reviews on the Google Chrome store. So if you're buying gifts this holiday season, then you need Honey. If you're not, you probably know someone who is, so do them a solid and tell them about Honey. Honey can help make sure that you're getting the best price for whatever you're buying. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com dot com slash smart that's joinhoney.com slash smart and now back to the episode i like it well you know i think we can move on you've got plenty of other things to add to this i really just thought for somebody who writes about something as difficult to write about as happiness and awesomeness just given what it what it sets up as i think that'd be it was a it was a something i wanted to discuss with you one thing i will add and i heard this i have no idea where i heard it is this word awesome? And since you own it, somebody said, a smart person once told me, you know, uh, why do we use awesome so commonly now? Because by doing so, we are literally removing the point of the word, right? Yeah. And, and by the way, well, Urban Dictionary defines awesome as the word Americans use to describe everything. <laughs> and I... I have been accused in the largest newspaper in Canada where I live, like there's been op-eds written about me saying that I am personally responsible for bleaching the English language. Um, So if you actually read up on me on my Wikipedia page, there's like references to this article where they like took me down a notch for overusing the word awesome. Now, here's my, since you gave the argument for why we shouldn't use it, let me give you the argument why we should. I do get people saying to me sometimes in interviews or wherever, it's like, no, no, you got to save that word for its original biblical intention like when you stare in awe at the grand canyon or the milky way uh from your campsite in the middle of nowhere that's awesome and what i say to those people is okay true that is awesome but if you only focus on these tiny little moments like how often are you at the grand canyon or how often do you hear the sound of a new baby screeching in the delivery room or how often do you get a diploma on stage after four years of of college if you only focus on those then you only have like 10 of those (laughs) for your whole life that's it and because life is so short we only have thirty thousand days to live that's the average lifespan right now then if you if you save up for those 10 the, the first day of your new house the 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 sight of you know, sailing over the ocean on your 50th wedding anniversary, then guess what? You are essentially saying to yourself that 99.99999% of my life is not awesome. And I disagree with that fundamentally. I believe that the small, tiny pleasures like this stimulating conversation with a guy I did not know an hour ago, and I love talking to you. You're fantastic. So guess what? This is an awesome thing for me. I get to have, a like, I just woke up. 
and I, my brain gets to be poked. This is the best. I should, I, you should, we should talk every day because I love this. But <laughs> I didn't, if I didn't think this was awesome, I would just write it off and be like, well, when's that trip? I'm going to come on my 50th wedding anniversary. No, the reason I wrote the book of awesome. And by the way, for those that don't know the book, it has, it's essentially like watching cream go into coffee, you know, flipping to the cold side of the pillow in the middle of the night, walking by the smell of a bakery, finding $5 in your old coat pocket, you know, uh, getting called up to the dinner buffet first at a wedding. These are the things I am pausing to savor and to obviously write an essay about each one. And I, the reason I think it's worth it is because when you start to focus on these small, quote unquote, trivial things, and you realize that they are awesome, and you focus on them as if they're awesome, they become awesome, you start to see more awesome, and you live in a more positive way, where throughout your day, you at the end of each day think, wow, I had a whole bunch of good stuff happen to me today. You are smiling more, you are shaking hands, better. You are providing energy and inspiration to your friends. Guess what? I provide energy and inspiration to my friends, most of them. And then the people that are friends with me, I'm like, they're kind of like this to me when I'm in a bad mood or when I'm dark and down. They're like, oh, yep. come on, Neil, like, look at this, blah, blah, blah. You know what happened to me? Blah, blah, blah. They do what I'm trying to do. And that is just a better way to live as seeing awesome everywhere. You know, respect on that. And and this was, I literally got goosebumps. I only get, they're a great telltale sign for me because it's when something tr- like deeply resonates. I believe it to be just authentically true. And I agree with you on that. You know, I, I have wrestled often with, well, is the wording right? But the wording doesn't matter. I'll never forget. I had this thing etched in my mind. I was about 20, I think I was 22. Uh, I was living, it was one of the first houses I lived at outside of college with some friends where around a fire, it's like a Thursday night, probably drinking some beers, but not drunk, you know, because I wouldn't remember it if I was. And I, a friend, you know, I'm looking around and I said, guys, let's just pause for a minute. Like the fire is beautiful. It's, I'm really enjoying this conversation with you. Uh, it's reflecting off the trees. The weather's great. Like I'm, this is just an amazing night. And my friends, by the way, they all call me hippie and stuff for these types of things. It's pretty funny. But she, one of my friends looked at me and she said, you're the only person that would say that. And it was such a compliment. Now, I don't think she meant it as one, but it was such a compliment because I truly believe exactly what you're saying that this has to either be cultivated or, and I think some of it is genetic, that you have to notice these things and realize the impact, the importance, and the beauty in them, because that really is what life is all about. It's the only way to pull us out of the, honestly, the the muck. Uh, I'm so glad that you said that that your friend noticed it and that it resonated with you because to me, that's what makes you a great person and part of what makes you an interesting person to be around. I was just at my cousin's wedding and the best man told a speech that brought the room to tears and it was an unconventional speech. And he essentially told a story about the groom, um, which was what they were all at a concert. It was like a kind of like a, a great warm night. They're listening to music. They were all dancing. And, and Eric, the, the groom, turned to the best man as he recounted in the speech and said, and just mouth the words, we're so lucky, you know? Hmm. And uh, everyone started crying in the audience because it was like, it, how true is that? You know, yeah. it's like, I can't believe we have consciousness. Hmm. What is the universe? No one knows what this is, why it's here, where it came from, what's above it, what's below it. We have no sense. We will never know. We don't know. There's some energy that just came here and we got to ha- have consciousness. We got to live in the best time ever with the most evolution possible into our brains that we live in these days. We can press a button and a car can pick us up. We can press another button and foods at our front door. Are you kidding me? We live like kings. We, we are, it's crazy how good it is to be out there right now. And yet we have the highest ever rates of anxiety, loneliness, suicide, and depression. And this is exactly why I'm so passionate about this work because our feelings for how good things are, it's just not there yet. In fact, it's getting worse. And this is partly driven by cell phones and internet and news and all this kind of crazy stuff. Well, this gets into, and I do want to touch on, I think it's actually a great lead into your book, You Are Awesome. And as you just talk about resilience and failure, because as we've spent 30 minutes or so, and I've kind of been prodding you on your life's work, it's very easy, I think, for some people to get defensive And I believe that those people are just building a house on a poor foundation. And so it's clear you've you've worked on your foundation. And I want to learn about that resilience and how you utilize it. Right. When you get that TED talk, I mean, for anyone who's ever built anything, the scariest thing is a poor response. 
And a TED Talk, I know from auditioning and, and, and seeing people and talking to people, is one of those things. So to have both the highs and the lows, I'm curious, you know, we don't have a lot of time and that's okay because it's in the book and we've had a great conversation, but give us your, your biggest takeaways on this idea of resiliency, what you would like to pass along to 20,000 people or so about how to navigate these difficult times in terms of our, our mentality, as opposed to our physical, you know, world that is so great. So, um, first of all, the way I define resilience, and I do not buy the dictionary definitions, which are sort of like trite and overly simplistic about, you know, sort of getting back up or whatever. The way I define resilience is, it is the ability to see the little sliver of light right between the door and the frame after you hear the latch click, okay? It is the sense that no matter what happens to you in your life, it does not define who you are, but simply where you are. I I just found out last night that You Are Awesome is going to debut at number one on the international bestseller list. Honestly, that did not send me flying into the stratosphere like it may have on a previous book. I also found out last night that You Are Awesome, despite having the sales numbers to qualify for the New York Times bestseller list, is, was not voted onto the island of the New York Times bestseller list, which, as you probably know, is editorialized. So they, mm-hmm. it, lots of books can fit the numbers, and then they decide which books to put on the list. Um, so that would have sent me dramatically falling uh, on a previous book because I'd be like, I worked so hard, and we had so many pre-orders, and what did they do wrong? And you know what? That's outsourcing my emotions to somebody else, and I can't control it. What I'm saying is if you can let the highs not make take you too high, let the lows not take you too low, then you have started to, started to, slowly master resilience. But getting there, I'm 40. You think getting there has been easy? Man, I have been, a girl would text me once, and I'd be in love with her to the point of marriage in my brain. And then when I didn't hear back from her, I, I'm not joking. It sounds hilarious, but I'd like I'd like be upset about it for two weeks. I'd be talking about it with all my friends. I'm like, why didn't Jessica text me back? Like we we kissed. Like we had a great first date. Like I, but I don't understand. Like why didn't she text me? Back? And I'd be like stuck on it for weeks. It was like one date, right? And this is why I'm writing the book on resilience because I'm thin skinned. I am low resilience. I have had to develop this musculature. If I'm getting better at it, it's only because I'm researching and thinking about it, talking about it, and studying it, and hopefully as I get older, practicing it. Sometimes you just have to have more flops in order to have more successes, take more pictures, take more shots, and eventually you get comfortable with the ones you that go in and ones that don't. I want to end it on this. As a creator, as so many people out there listening, I know are, how, so let's say writing a book, or in my mind right now, I really want to start doing videos just about, because my big thing is helping people find the work they want to enjoy. I just think it's, It's just one of the highest reasons of unhappiness these days is we're lacking meaning in what we do. And that happened once the Industrial Revolution came around. And it's just, I've dedicated literally since 21 to 36, so 15 years to finally get there. And it's not really a destination. I think it is a mentality, but that's not the point. The point is, I'm trying to convince myself to just get on a camera and just talk and see if people jive with it. But again, I struggle with two things. One, Does the world need more junk? Two, is it really good what I have to say? And then three, though, is who is going to judge if it's good or not? And what I'm wondering, when you say I'm not going to outsource my happiness, et cetera, to other people, given that we've already discussed that as humans, we want our work to resonate, how can we balance, and you only have two minutes to answer this, so I'm sorry about that, but how can we balance, I want my work to resonate, but I actually don't care, or I'm not outsourcing if it doesn't? Um, You can't focus on the former. You have to focus on the latter. If you put your head down and keep focusing on your art and keep trying new things, eventually you will hit things that do both. But you can't do the latter if you're focusing on the former. If you want to start a YouTube channel that gets millions of subscribers, you never will get one. If If you want to start a YouTube channel that like helps people with severe depression because you share stories of your own in a unique and innovative way, bam, that'll take off. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And in terms of starting, like I think not you particularly, but people often confuse motivation and action. They think, because we have big brains and we overthink things, blah, 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 all of us do, including myself, 
Um, myself, I think is a, is a good new word. I like that. I like just, I'm like I like talking that. like Elmo. Me that self. is not getting edited. No way. That is staying in. De- never edit. I say like 12 words wrong in every one of my podcasts. People are like, it's uh, scarcity, buddy, not scarcity. I'm like, whatever. It's scarcity. I don't know how to – I know how to read. So I don't know how to talk. Anyway, um, <laughs> motivation. the alarm of our time, by the way. The alarm. Look, you don't need motivation to have action. You need action to create motivation. If you just start something, the motivation follows. We mistake those two things. Okay, you want to run a marathon? You don't need fancy shoes and a nice playlist. You just need to run to the stop sign in your dress shoes. Then the next day you'll be like, well, I did it once. I'll do it again. Motivation follows action. It does not precede action. Completely agree. Hopefully this will provide enough motivation to get people to take that action and then continue moving it along. Actually, if you do, email me. I want to hear the things you built, the things you did, you ran to that stop sign because of this interview. Neil, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for kind of going on this dance with me really quickly. And of course, we will give more in the in our outro, but where do you want to guide people? You've got this book. You are awesome. It's coming out at number one. Uh, where else should we go? Well, first of all, it, so everything is available at neil.blog, just N-E-I-L dot blog, neil dot blog. But because you were kind enough to say email me, I'll say the same thing. I love people that make it to the end of the podcast. They're my favorite people. Yeah. My email address is neil at globalhappiness.org, N-E-I-L at globalhappiness.org. If you liked what you saw uh, or, or we talked about something interesting, just drop me a line. CC Chris on it, and it'd be great to keep the conversation going. Definitely CC me. All right, Neil, you got a call. Thanks so much. We will email and catch up soon. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. That was Neil Pasricha, and I thoroughly hope that you all enjoyed that interview. Just as a reminder, his newest book, You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life, is available at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And of course, I know you've heard it a thousand times before, but if you do decide to purchase on Amazon, Make sure you do so through our Amazon link at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, you can always leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. And if you'd like to reach out to the show for any reason, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned as we've got a lot of great interviews coming up. So we will see you all next episode.